All right, students, welcome to Chapter 7. And Chapter 7 really marks a turning point in our semester, and particularly in the book, where we shift into Part 2, where now we're really learning about hypotheses and hypothesis testing, which we learned from Week 1 is really one of the main objectives and one of the main purposes of statistics, is being able to test hypotheses. So Chapter 7 will cover what a hypothesis is, how we formulate hypotheses using words, as well as how we formulate hypotheses using equations. So our objectives for this chapter are to understand this idea of sampling error, know to understand and create null and research hypotheses, also known as alternative hypotheses, know the difference between directional and non-directional research hypotheses, know the difference between one and two-tailed tests, and know how to create equations for various hypotheses. And you're going to create equations for both null and directional and non-directional research hypotheses. All right, so let's talk about our first objective, the whole idea of sampling error. We'll see this much more in a few chapters later, but I want to introduce the idea now. So we see here population. Think of all the professors in the U.S. And let's say we ask all college students in the U.S. to rate their professors on how much you like them, where one is I hate these professors and five is I love these professors. And we see here the mu, which means population mean. So the population mean, the parameter, is three in terms of likability. So on average, moderate likability for all U.S. professors. But again, thinking about the feasibility of being able to do this type of research or collect this type of data, it probably isn't realistic for any researcher to collect data on all students, on all professors in the U.S. So what we end up doing is we end up pulling samples throughout the U.S. Maybe we'll have Samples from Harvard, Yale, Cal State Fullerton, Cal State Long Beach, Stanford, Texas, Michigan, all sorts of different universities. And let's say we have nine different universities here. And we see that for each of the universities, we have a sample mean in terms of likabilities of the college professors. So, again, this big population, we have all of our U.S. college professors, but we have nine different studies, and these different studies looked at samples throughout the U.S., and each of these samples made up a group of college professors, and the students were the ones that they sampled in terms of collecting the information on how much did they like their professors. And so the difference between our population parameter, which in this case is 3, and our sample statistics, we see we have a 3, a 2, a 4, a 3, 1, 4, 3, 5, and 2, that the difference between the sample statistic and the population parameter is simply what our sampling error is. We have a numerical value. The difference between our sample and our population is considered our sampling error. So if we took each of these nine samples and plotted them on a bar chart, we would get something that looks like this, where our x-axis is the sample mean, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, or 1 is I hate this professor, and 5 is I love this professor, and our y-axis is how many times did we see this frequency occur, we see we have anywhere from 0 up to 3 in increments of half a point. And we see that our mode is a sample mean of 3, which occurred 3 times. We have, and if we look up above, we see that we have, in fact, 3 different samples of the 9 that had a sample mean of 3. But notice this standard deviation here, 1.22. This standard deviation is not of the individuals within one sample, this standard deviation is of 
the population. It's among the different samples that we pulled from the entire population. And this standard deviation is really the standard error of the mean. It's a standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean. And this bar chart here is our sampling distribution of all of the different means from all of the different samples that we pulled from the entire population. In this case, our entire population is of college professors, and we have nine different samples of college professors throughout the U.S. in which we sampled students to assess the likability of their professors. And so the standard error of the mean tells us the variability, how much variability there is in the mean between samples from the same population. So if you think about what we learned in chapter 3, measures of variability and measures of dispersion, we had standard deviation as one of those. And the standard deviation told us how much variability there was within one sample. And the variability was between the individuals or the cases or the participants within that one sample. When we're talking about standard error of the mean and sampling error, we're stepping it up one notch. We're not, we're not looking at the individuals within the sample. Now we're looking at the samples within the entire population. Thinking about inferential statistics. Can we infer the results that we find from a sample to the larger population? And so one of the main important purposes for sampling error is that the closer that the sample matches the population, or the statistic and the parameters are nearly identical, or as close as possible, the more the results are said to generalize. So if we have a smaller standard error of the mean, we have a smaller sampling error, the better our sample looks like the population, that the easier and highly reliable that we can say that our results from the sample is generalizable to the entire population. We'll see much more about sampling error in a few weeks.